As the Israeli armed forces head into Gaza in response to Hamas's October 7th attack, an obvious question arises. What is their end game? The world knows all too well what happens when a country does not have a good answer to that question. Just look at the United States' experience two decades ago, and how the endless war and this war dynamic played out. Will things be any different for Israel? Or is the operation doomed to duplicate the Iraq War and spiral into a bottomless pit of despair? Today, we are going to examine what Israel may be up to, and some of the problems that might arise in the process. We will begin by discussing the current tactical situation. That is, what Israel appears to physically be doing. But, as always, war is politics, so we need to contextualize that in the proper political bargaining framework. Lines on maps, baby. Today's focus will be on first strike advantages and war termination. We will then discuss the historical solutions to this problem. Mowing the grass, traditional peacekeeping, and demilitarized zones, including a brief diversion into the failed Russian peacekeeping operations between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And finally, we will examine one of the major obstacles that Israel will face if reducing first strike advantages is indeed the goal of the offensive. But we begin with the current tactical situation. Following the October 7th attack, Netanyahu declared that Israel was at war with Hamas. Israel then proceeded to sit around and not actually invade Gaza. Murmurs in the press began about what might be taking so long, apparently under the impression that offensives begin and end immediately. Sound familiar? But this was not actually Sitzkrieg 2.0. What happened during that period was a series of low-risk airstrikes and brief cross-border raids to capture weapons caches and soften targets before the next stage. Think of this as Israel's version of shock and awe, made famous by the United States, albeit for a briefer period, before the 2003 invasion of Iraq. If you want to know why states do this, then look no further than February 2022. Many European countries believed that Russia was bluffing, and thus were uninterested in taking proactive steps to stop an invasion. Meanwhile, the Kremlin believed that Ukrainians were going to roll over. Consequently, the plan called for a rapid capture of Ukrainian territory, and to turn it into a fait accompli for the rest of Europe. It has happened already, so taking serious countermeasures at this stage would be pointless. But the assumption that Ukraine was going to roll over turned out to be wrong. As a result, Ukraine was at full strength at the start of the ground attack. Rather than doing mop-up work, the Russian army instead had to do the heavy lifting. That ended up faring okay in the east, but was a bit of a disaster with the run on Kyiv. Back to the other war, it was no secret that Israel had major plans for Gaza, so preliminary attacks were not going to spoil anything. The waiting game also included a healthy dose of the usual economic sanctions, which most notably included cutting off fuel shipments, which in turn gave rise to an unhealthy dose of humanitarian concerns. With these effects combining together to weaken Hamas, and the telecoms sporadically going down and thereby leaving Hamas uncoordinated, Israel appears to be aiming to cut the strip in half. Troops are forming a salient here around the edge of Gaza City, and a more general push is coming in from the corner. The next step is a full invasion of Gaza City, which for now is just surrounded. There also appear to be some small incursions elsewhere, but the main action remains over there. So what are the broader political and strategic goals that these actions could accomplish? To answer that, we must return to the logic of first strike advantages and preemptive war. The basic logic is that Hamas has an ongoing ability to strike Israel at a time when the latter is unprepared. To convince Hamas not to do that, Israel's government must make substantial concessions. But Israel could alternatively preempt Hamas attacks, and paying the price for war may be better than the alternative from the government's perspective. It's a classic lines-on-maps problem. 
Now, there are a bunch of explanations that could be the underlying cause of the war. Things like Hamas trying to beat back Palestinian political competitors, or disrupting Israeli peace talks with Saudi Arabia. But let's focus on just the first strike stuff for today. It will occupy enough of our time anyway. Israel would be hard-pressed to walk away from the war. Yes, there has been a lot of talk about that. But let's not forget our favorite lines-on-maps logic. The precise vector of a future surprise attack might not take the form of paragliders again. But Hamas may easily find something else. And try as diplomats might, you cannot end a war until the fighting resolves the problem that started it. If that thing is first strike advantages, then Israel will continue until Hamas's shrinks down. And indeed, there are a few ways to fix things. One way is through the military consequences of that fighting. This is basically the mowing the grass strategy that Israel often engages in, except maybe on steroids this time. For Hamas to take advantage of first strike surprises, the group needs a sufficient level of baseline military capacity. As an extreme illustration, if Hamas has no guns, then the element of surprise will not change the group's inability to fight effectively against Israel. The costs are what start to matter, and you can get a deal done. For a more practical example, consider Israel's Iron Dome system, which shoots down incoming rockets from Gaza. If Hamas were Ukraine, I suppose this is where you might get out the HIMARS to blow up the defenses. But Hamas does not have access to precision Gimler's missiles that could specifically target Iron Dome. Thus, the simple solution that Hamas relied on was to shoot a ton of rockets all at once. Iron Dome is good at handling one rocket at a time, but Israel only has so many interceptors active at any given moment. If Hamas fires with reckless abandon, Iron Dome cannot handle the output, and the surplus will go through unimpeded. However, if Israel mows the rocket grass, that is no longer a possibility. Except Israel is not doing the lawn mowing with a push model. It is getting out the heavy hitter. The scale of Israel's post-October 7th operations appears aimed toward eradicating Hamas's offensive ability. The last time that there was major fighting between Israel and Hamas, the year was 2021, and Israel executed 1,500 artillery strikes and bombings. By the beginning of November 2023, that figure was already at 11,000. Clearly, the current operation is less about mowing and more about uprooting every last blade of grass. Still, this strategy leaves a lot to be desired as a long-term solution. Survey data showed that Gazans preferred avoiding war with Israel before the fighting began. But enough Palestinians were still sufficiently upset at Israeli policies to become militants. And the process of prosecuting the war will inevitably produce more. The point is that the seeds will persist, and the grass will grow back. And that means, absent something else, you are going to need the lawn mower again. And again. And again. Thus, Israel will want to look to combine mowing with other solutions. One that has been floated is a peacekeeping mission. I know that peacekeepers are often the butt of jokes, because they seemingly fail in their job so often. Heck, they lean into it. This is a photo of peacekeeper training, as you can see with the fake guns, and even the mock protester sign is telling them that they suck. Or maybe five uck, because it was hastily made. Whatever. Anyway, that is like criticizing hospitals because hospitals are where a lot of people pass away. Peacekeepers go where the baseline risk of war is high. Thus, looking at it strictly from a value-added perspective, they do fairly well. And one of the reasons for their success is how they can reduce first strike advantages. If they simply stand in the way of two parties, whoever decides to go on the offensive first has to fight their way through the peacekeepers. That slows things down, negating the thing that otherwise makes peace infeasible. The real problem is finding peacekeepers actually willing to follow through on their job. To hammer that point home, look no further than Armenia and Azerbaijan. Long story short, there is a region inside of Azerbaijan called Nagorno-Karabakh. 
it is, or increasingly was, full of Armenians. And the place has been a mess since the fall of the Soviet Union. After another scuffle broke out in 2020, Russian peacekeepers entered to pacify the situation. And it worked. For a few years. But then Russia decided to invade Ukraine, where things did not quite go as well as anticipated. With speculation mounting that Russia was facing a manpower shortage, Azerbaijan wagered that Russian peacekeepers no longer had credibility. If push came to shove, they would just leave rather than be reinforced. So Azerbaijan went in, and indeed Russia did nothing to stop them. And that is the big hang-up in discussions of bringing peacekeepers into Gaza. Who is actually going to command their soldiers to push back when death is on the line? That is how we get to a more plausible option, a demilitarized zone. You are likely most familiar with DMZs from the Korean Peninsula, and yes, I will use any excuse to show this photo. The Korean DMZ is 4 kilometers wide, stretches across the entire peninsula, and has been a fixture of politics in the region since the end of the Korean War. One of its purposes is to serve as the background for the world's most dangerous golf course. No, seriously, this is a real thing, right next to the DMZ. The pin looks like an American flag, the greens are not natural, and the fairways are atrocious. Yes, that is supposed to be a fairway. But hey, beggars can't be choosers. Thumbs up, gentlemen. Just don't chase the ball very far. Oh, and it doubles as a course for Easter egg hunts. I refer any further questions to my press secretary. That is a real photo, by the way. Anyway, one of the real purposes of the Korean DMZ is to mitigate the element of surprise. If a North Korean convoy wants to attack South Korea, or vice versa, they have to drive through the DMZ first. Prior to October 7th, Israel had something like that in place. Israel imposes a seaborne blockade on Gaza, controlling what comes in and goes out. Meanwhile, back on land, the border wall that surrounds Gaza is well known. This was not the type of wall that tourists might want to take a leisurely stroll along. Rather, it includes underground extensions to prevent tunneling underneath, which has been a recurring problem and will continue to be so during the conflict. Going deeper, Within 100 meters on the Gazan side was the exclusion zone. This is why the border is so visible from space. It's not the wall itself, it's the no-man's land. However, since 2018, farmers were permitted to tend fields up to 300 meters, but farming by foot only. For security reasons, no tractors allowed. Nonetheless, the October 7th attack demonstrated that the 300 meters gave insufficient warning time. Some part of Israel's efforts appear geared toward extending that out. Further, the wall itself was no match for simple bulldozers. One might imagine that Israel would want to better fortify the exclusion zone. Israel is using landmines to temporarily secure the holes in the wall. Whether they will extend those further is a dicey political question, given international norms against their use. And remember, with a name of a ban as long as this, you know that they mean business. Something like long lines of Czech hedgehogs, designed to make it impossible for vehicles to cross, seems inevitable. However, there is a major problem with this strategy. Let's go back to the Korean Peninsula. It is deep, going from one country to the other. In contrast, though, it is not especially wide going across. The Gaza Strip is the opposite. It is wide, but it is not deep, especially in some areas. What that means is that there is just not much space for a DMZ, especially if Israel intends to build it on the Palestinian side. Using the Korean DMZ's 4 kilometers as a comparison, the exclusion zone would look something like this when applied to Gaza. Obviously, this already appears problematic, but somehow it gets worse. Land is at a premium in Gaza. You do not have the space for casual golf courses out there. The Strip already has 2.4 million people crammed within the existing border. Removing 160 square kilometers would increase its population density to 11,000 people per square kilometer, far exceeding Singapore's 8250, and only falling short of Monaco's 18,000, 
which hardly feels like much of a consolation, given that Monaco has 36,000 people total. And never mind that many people's homes and livelihoods would be ruined in the process. That is a good way to radicalize someone who was previously apathetic about the whole affair. Thus, much of the game Israel is playing right now is calculating the optimal balance between extending the DMZ and just making the problem worse. Now, you won't find an answer to that question here, but you can find a playlist that will take you further in-depth on the strategy of the conflict. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care.